remember back in the 70s, there was a movie that came out called Jesus of Nazareth. It was one of the ones that came out. It was kind of cutting edge at the time. I still love watching it. Of course, Jesus had piercing blue eyes, which we know he doesn't have. But there's a scene in the documentary or the movie where the Romans are coming into Judea, and they're basically trying to excise taxes from the Jewish people. And once they tell them they have to pay their taxes, they leave and they scoff the Jewish people. And in the movie, in one of the scenes, a Jewish man runs out into the middle of the village and he falls on his knees and he's clearly in anguish. And he says in a real loud voice, how long, O Lord, before you avenge our blood? How long? And of course, Jesus is 12 years old, and he's looking at this man as he's saying it with his piercing blue eyes. Well, that's what we want to talk about this evening in Zechariah chapter 6. We're going to learn how God is going to one day avenge Israel's enemies, and he's going to establish his universal rule. So turn, if you will, to Zechariah chapter 6, Zechariah chapter 6. Now, if you remember, as we've been saying Week after week, the reason why John and I repeat ourselves is because it takes time to get these things down, especially when you're dealing with an apocalyptic book like Zechariah. If you remember, the Israelites had come back from Babylon. They were in Babylon 70 years, and they came all the way back, next slide, to Jerusalem. And while they were there in Jerusalem, God instructed them to rebuild the temple. And they laid the foundation of the temple initially, and they got it going. But because of discouragement, because of them getting distracted with the building of their own homes, and because they faced opposition from their enemies, the project of rebuilding the temple ended up stopping, and they halted the work of the Lord for approximately 16 years. And so God raises up the prophet Zechariah, and he gives him eight visions in order to motivate the people to rebuild the temple. God began to not bless them because they were being disobedient to him. And so he's motivating them through these eight visions that Zechariah had in one night to motivate them to rebuild the temple and basically so that God could bless them. Now, what are the visions that we've looked at thus far? In the first five chapters, we've looked at the first seven visions. The first one are the four horsemen in the ravine. Now, remember, the ravine represents the fact that Israel was in a low point as she came back from Babylon. They were a low point in their history. The temple was destroyed. The walls were torn down. And so the four horsemen represents the fact that God would fight Israel's battles for her and that God would give Israel ultimate victory. And so that was a vision of encouragement. Then in chapter 1, we looked at the four horns and the four craftsmen, or the four hammers, and that represented in chapter 1 that God would defeat Israel's enemies and give them victory. And then in chapter 2, we looked at the measuring line or the measuring stick, and that represented the fact that God would help Israel rebuild the city and he would help rebuild the temple. Whenever you go out to a construction site, for example, if you go on Highway 1, you see that horse farm that construction company just bought, and evidently they're going to build houses on that particular property. Well, whenever you see measuring lines and you see measuring sticks, what that indicates is rebuilding or building. And so what God is communicating to the Israelites is, I'm going to rebuild your city, I'm going to rebuild your temple. And then, of course, you get to chapter 3, we looked at the vision of Joshua and the cleansing of Joshua, the high priest, and basically what that symbolized was God was going to reestablish the priesthood once the temple is rebuilt, God would reestablish the priesthood, and Joshua's cleansing was a symbol of how God would cleanse the nation from their sin. And then in chapter 4, God gives them the vision of the lampstand with the oil, and that represented the fact that God, by his power, by his spirit, 
would enable the people to rebuild the temple so that they could be a witness nation because the lampstand, if you remember, represents Israel. And then we looked at last week, chapter 5, and this was two visions. The first one was the flying scroll, and the flying scroll represented the Word of God. And basically what God was doing was issuing to Israel a warning that they had fallen into disobedience for 16 years plus, and God was going to punish them if they did not get their act together. So that's the flying scroll, which represented the Word of God. And then we looked at in chapter 5 also the woman in the basket, and that was the woman of wickedness. And remember, she tried to get out of the basket, and basically the angel pushed her back in the basket, and that woman represented sin within Israel, particularly the sin of materialism, because she was in a basket which was an ephah, which represented commerce. And so basically, they had fallen into this materialistic attitude. They were focused on building their own homes, and they weren't taking care of building God's temple, and so God was going to transport this woman of evil back to Babylon. And so that's the first seven visions that we looked at. Now, we want to look at the final vision tonight, and that would be vision number eight, and it would be the four chariots and the cleansing, or rather the crowning of Joshua. You have the four chariots and you have the crowning of Joshua. And what the four chariots represent in chapter 6 is God basically going to judge Israel's enemies, and the crowning of Joshua represents the fact that Jesus Christ, after Israel's enemies are judged, Jesus is going to come back and he's going to set up his universal kingdom. That's why you have the crowning of Joshua. And so let's look at the first point this evening. And that would be God's judgment on Israel's enemies. God's judgment on Israel's enemies. Now, remember when you're dealing with these visions of Joshua, you have a near fulfillment and you have a far fulfillment. And so when you look at God's judgment on Israel's enemies, you have a near fulfillment that basically happened in the time of Zechariah somewhat prior to Zechariah and also after Zechariah. And so there is a near fulfillment when it comes to God judging Israel's enemies. But there also is a far fulfillment of God judging Israel's enemies. And we're going to look at that this evening. So let's pick up in chapter 6, verse 1. It says, Now I lifted up my eyes again and looked, and behold... Four, and the number four, by the way, is a universal number. It represents the four points of a compass. And so you have north, south, east, and west. And so he's lifting up his eyes, and he notices four chariots. Now, what do chariots represent in the Bible? They often represent war. In fact, do you remember seeing the movie Ben-Hur? Most of you probably have seen that movie, and there are chariots where Charlton Heston is basically in this battle against his best friend. His best friend had turned on him, and they're in this war, as it were, and they're riding chariots. In the Bible, chariots often represent war, and so you have these four chariots, as it were, in the north, south, east, and west, and it says here, they were coming forth from between two mountains. Now, most commentators believe that these two mountains that these four chariots are coming out of represent Mount Zion and the Mount of Olives. And notice it says, in the mountains were bronze mountains. Now, mountains in the Bible are a symbol of strength, but the fact that they were bronze mountains represents the fact of God's judgment. Because whenever you see bronze in the Bible, that is a symbol of God judging. And so the picture here is you have these four war chariots coming out of these two bronze mountains, which represents war. And what this symbolizes <clears throat> is the fact that God is going to judge Israel's enemies from the north, the south, the east, and the west. Now, verse 2 further explains this judgment when it says this, with the first chariot... There were red horses. 
Now, red in the Bible represents war. With the second chariot, there were black horses. That represents famine and pestilence. And it says in verse 3, with the third chariot, there were white horses. That represents victory. And with the fourth chariot, strong, dappled horses. That represents death. And so you have these four horses that are basically hooked to these chariots, and what they represent is famine, pestilence, death, and victory. And so in verse 4, Zechariah says, Then I spoke and said to the angel who was speaking with me, What are these, my Lord? The angel replied to me, These are the four spirits of heaven going forth after standing before the Lord of all the earth. In other words, the four spirits here represent what? Angels. These are angels riding these four chariots. And what these angels are doing on the four chariots that are coming through this, these bronze mountains is they are implementing God's judgment on Israel's enemies. Now, in the Bible, angels are used for various tasks. If you read the Bible, angels implement God's judgment, but the Bible also talks about protecting angels. If you read Matthew chapter 18, if you read Psalm 34, it implies that we all have guardian angels. There are angels in the book of Revelation that are over the elements of the earth, over the wind, over the rain, over the snow, over certain things that happen. I think the angelic realm is far more involved than what you and I know because we cannot see them. And so here are these angels basically riding these four chariots because it says in verse 5, these are the four spirits of heaven going forth after standing before the Lord. And in verse 6, with one of which the black horses are going forth to the north country and the white ones go forth after them while the dappled ones go forth to the south country. Now what is this talking about? What it's basically saying is this, these angels that are riding these four chariots coming out of the mountains, they're going to judge Israel's enemies. And listen, if you study history, Israel's enemies came primarily from the north and from the south. Because in the west, you had the Mediterranean Sea, and then the east, it was too far to cross the desert. And so Israel's enemies primarily came from the north and from the south. And so these angels on their chariots are going, as it were, to the north and to the south in order to judge Israel's enemies. But the fact that it talks about four chariots and four angels on those chariots, it's really implying that God is going to defeat Israel's enemies from the north, the south, the east, and the west. That's the number four. It is a universal number. And notice in verse 7, it says, when the strong ones went out, that is the angels, they were eager to go to patrol the earth. In other words, they're waiting for God's orders to get their bidding so that they could go out and judge Israel's enemies. And he said, to obviously the angels, go patrol the earth. Go look for the nations that oppressed Israel and judge them. So they patrolled the earth. Then he cried out to me in verse 8, and he spoke to me saying, see, those are going to the land of the north have appeased my wrath in the land of the north. In other words, when one of the angels went to the land of the north, God defeated the Babylonians, as it were, and God's wrath was appeased. Why? Because the Babylonians were judged for what they did to Israel. And so, here's the significance of these four chariots and the angels riding on them. What God is saying is he's going to judge Israel's enemies. And that was supposed to be an encouragement to the remnant that had come back from Babylon. Now, remember what I said. There is a near fulfillment to this and a far fulfillment. What is the near fulfillment of this in terms of the four chariots and God conquering Israel's enemies? Well, you'll notice up on the screen the slide, and you can see the near fulfillment in that God defeated Israel's enemies. 
He did it prior to Zechariah when he defeated Egypt, when he defeated Assyria, and he defeated Babylon. And then, of course, after Zechariah's time, God defeated the Persians, he defeated the Greeks, and he also defeated, ultimately, the Romans. Now, Rome will reemerge itself in the end times. We will have Rome number two. And so the near fulfillment of this is God is telling Israel, I am going to defeat your enemies, I am going to judge them, and God did exactly that. Now we look back and we see the historical fulfillment of this taking place, which by the way shows us that God keeps his word. That's one of the evidences that we can trust the Bible, is the Bible is the word of God. Why? Because it fulfills prophecy. God said through these four chariots and the angels riding on them and the different colors of the horses, I am going to judge your enemies, and God did that in terms of the historical fulfillment. But there's also a far fulfillment, not just a near fulfillment, but there is a far fulfillment in terms of the fact that God will judge Israel's enemies. And in the far fulfillment, there are four ways that God is going to judge Israel's enemies in the future, and you and I are still awaiting for this to happen. First of all, during the tribulation period, then the battle of Gog and Magog, then Armageddon and the second coming, and then the end of the millennial, we will see God judge Israel's enemies. Let's look at each of these real briefly. First of all, in terms of the tribulation, God will judge Israel's enemies. Now, I want you to notice this slide because there is a parallel here. Notice Zechariah 6, you have these four horses, and they represent death, famine, war, and victory. But if you go to the book of Revelation, chapter 6, you see these four horsemen as well, and you see the same colors. And so, this historical fulfillment in Zechariah 6 has a prophetic element in the future When if you read Revelation chapter 6, you see these same colored horses. They're called the four horsemen of the what? Apocalypse. Now, what is this talking about in Revelation 6? It's talking about the tribulation period. During the tribulation period, the Antichrist is going to turn on Israel at the midpoint of the tribulation. And you know what God is going to do? He's not going to allow all Jews to live. He is going to allow the Antichrist to persecute them. But listen carefully. God is going to preserve, according to Revelation chapter 7, a remnant. And that remnant is known as the 144,000. God will protect that remnant during the tribulation period. And ultimately, what is God going to do? He's going to destroy the Antichrist. He's going to be thrown into the lake of fire. And so, in a sense, Israel, although Israel will be persecuted during the tribulation, a remnant will come through the tribulation and they will enter the millennial kingdom. And so God will defeat Israel's enemies during the tribulation and he will preserve a remnant during that time, even though the Antichrist wants to wipe them off the map. And so in terms of the far fulfillment, you have the tribulation. God will defeat Israel's enemies. But then you have another aspect, and that is Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog. God will defeat Israel's enemies during this battle. Now, what is the battle of Gog and Magog? We don't have time to get into it, but if you read Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, it's a fascinating passage. You will notice that there are these nations that are going to align themselves against Israel. Magog, Meshach, Cush, uh, Rosh, you have Persia. Now, if you take all these nations right here in their ancient names and you translate them today, here are the nations that are going to come against Israel in the future, Russia, Turkey, Syria, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Ethiopia, Egypt, and Libya. And what you're basically going to have here in the battle of Gog and Magog is a Russian-Arab coalition. Because you will notice most of these nations are Arab. And so you're going to have the Russians and the Arabs come together, and they're basically going to attack Israel. And what God is going to do, watch this, during the battle of Gog and Magog, is he's going to intervene, and he's going to protect Israel during that time. He's going to defeat Israel's enemies. 
just to give you a snippet of Ezekiel, it says this. God says, this is what will happen in that day when Gog, by the way, Gog represents the leader. It's a title like Pharaoh or Caesar. When Gog attacks the land of Israel, here's what God says. My hot anger will be aroused, declares the sovereign Lord. In my zeal and fiery wrath, I declare that at that time there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. By the way, Nothing historically fits this. This is why we believe it's future. The fish in the sea, verse 20, the birds in the sky, the beasts of the field, every creature that moves along the ground, and all the people on the face of the earth will tremble at my presence. The mountains will be overturned, the cliffs will crumble, and every wall will fall to the ground. I will summon a sword against Gog, he's the leader of this coalition, On all my mountains, declares the sovereign Lord, every man's sword will be against his brother. I will execute judgment on him with plague and bloodshed. I will pour down torrents of rain, hailstone, and burning sulfur on him and his troops and on the many nations with him. See, that's the coalition there. And so I will show my greatness and my holiness, and I will make myself known in the sight of many nations, then they will know that I am the Lord. This is going to be a supernatural defeat of these nations that come together to try to defeat Israel and basically annihilate them. There's a lot of speculation as to why they're doing this. A lot of people believe it's because of oil. We really don't know, but they're going to come down on Israel, and God is going to declare himself before the nations by defeating these enemies of Israel, and therefore God will be Israel's protector. He will defeat Israel's enemies. And then in Ezekiel 39, verse 7, God says it explicitly, I will make make known my holy name, here it is, among my people Israel. I will no longer let my holy name be profane, and the nations will know that I am the Lord, I am the Holy One in Israel. It is coming. It will surely take place, declares the Sovereign Lord. This is the day I have spoken of. And so there is a far fulfillment to Zechariah chapter 6. Those four chariots not only speak of God defeating Israel's enemies historically, but there is a far fulfillment where God is going to defeat Israel's enemies during the tribulation period and during the battle of Gog and Magog. Now the $64 million question is, when is the battle of Gog and Magog going to take place? And the answer is, we don't know. There are different views on this. One view says it's going to happen before the middle of the tribulation. Another view says it's going to happen at the end of the millennium. And this view, when you read Revelation 20, it mentions Gog and Magog. Some say it's going to happen there. Another view says that it's actually the battle of Armageddon. They would say Gog and Magog and the Battle of Armageddon are one and the same, just two different names. Others would say it's going to happen before the seven-year tribulation. We really don't know. We cannot be dogmatic. But we do know during this battle that God is going to protect Israel and he's going to make his name known before the nations. And so we've seen God protecting Israel and defeating Israel's enemies during the tribulation, during the battle of Gog and Magog. There's a third area where God in the future will defeat Israel's enemies, and that is Armageddon and the second coming, because those two basically happen almost at the same time. You do have the battle of Armageddon, which will last for a time, and then following Armageddon will be the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now notice that the battle of Armageddon, You have all these nations converging on Israel from the east. Revelation 16 talks about this from the north. You have it from the south. You have the Antichrist coming in, and they're going to converge on Israel. And basically, during the Battle of Armageddon, what they're going to try to do is wipe Israel off the map. Now, I know this may seem far-fetched, Although these prophecies are becoming more and more clear in our time, when you see what's going on with Russia and Iran and all of the stuff that's going on politically, we see the pieces of the puzzle beginning to form more in our lifetime than any previous generation. 
And so it's during this time, during the Battle of Armageddon, by the way, it's not a battle, it's a military campaign that will happen over a period of time. And it will culminate with them converging on Israel, and basically Jesus Christ is going to come back, Revelation 19 says, with a sword coming out of his mouth, and what he's going to do is he's going to defeat those enemies at the Battle of Armageddon, and he will be Israel's protector. Now this doesn't mean no Jews will die. Jewish people will die, but God will not allow the nation to be eradicated. He will have a remnant that he preserves. Now you say, well, what happens when he comes back at the Battle of Armageddon? Well, let me show you the next slide, and this is fascinating. Do you remember Zechariah 6? You had the four horses, and notice they're coming out of what many scholars believe to be the Mount of Olives and Mount Zion. Now if you read Zechariah chapter 14, it says this, when Jesus Christ comes back at his second coming, here's what he's going to do. The Bible says he's going to come back at the Mount of Olives right here. The Mount of Olives is where he left when he ascended in Acts chapter 1. He's going to come back, and it says in Zechariah 14 that he's going to split the Mount of Olives to the north and to the south. Now, could this be a prophecy right here in Zechariah 6 where Jesus comes back, as it were, here are the four horsemen, and Jesus is going to split the mountain right in half, and that's the symbolism there of Zechariah chapter 6. And so this is going to happen when he comes back, and again, what is he going to do when he comes back, splits the Mount of Olives, and sets up his thousand-year millennial kingdom? Well, Matthew 25 gives us a hint of what Jesus is going to do when he splits the mountains and he comes back to set up his kingdom. It says in verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory... And all the angels with him, watch this, he will sit on his glorious throne. He splits the mountain, he's going to set up his kingdom, and I don't know all the details of how that's going to happen, none of us knows. And notice what it says here, all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and it says he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And if you read the rest of the passage in Matthew 25, many people believe that the separation of the sheep from the goats is going to be based on not only their faith in Jesus Christ, but watch this, how they treated Israel. How they treated Israel. And you know what God is going to do? He's going to purge Two-thirds of the rebels, that is of the Jews, two out of every three Jews will be purged, not only during the tribulation period, but when Jesus Christ comes back to set up his kingdom. Listen to what Ezekiel 20 says about God purging people and the Jews as well. He says, I will bring you from the nations and gather you from the countries where you have been scattered with a mighty hand and outstretched arm and with outpoured wrath. I will bring you into the wilderness of the nations and there face to face. God says to Israel, I will execute judgment upon you. As I judge your ancestors in the wilderness and of the land of Egypt, so I will judge you, declares the Lord. God is going to purge out a bunch of Jews, and he's going to protect the ones that what? That are his remnant. He's going to preserve them. Ezekiel 20 says this, I will take note of you as you pass under my rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. And God says, I will, verse 38, purge you of those who revolt and rebel against me. Although I will bring them out of the land where they are living, yet they will not enter the land of Israel, then you will know that I am the Lord. And in Zechariah 13, 9, it says this, and I will bring the third part through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. Then they will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. And so God, when he comes back through Jesus Christ, he sets up his millennial kingdom. You know what he's going to do? He's going to purge out the rebels of the Jewish people, and he's also what? He's going to protect that remnant. He's going to protect that remnant during the tribulation period, during the battle of Gog and Magog, and he's going to protect a remnant of Jews during his coming when he sets up his kingdom and he splits the Mount of Olives. 
And then there is number four, the end of the millennial. God is going to protect Israel. He's going to defeat their enemies. If you read right here at the end of the millennial, you have this final battle. It's called Gog and Magog. At the end of the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year kingdom, there's going to be one final rebellion that's going to take place, which, by the way, shows you that even with Satan being bound, man's nature is still evil. People are going to have fallen natures because during the millennial kingdom, people will be born. You'll have people with glorified bodies in the millennial kingdom. You will have people with regular bodies during the millennial kingdom. You say, where did they get their regular bodies? People that survived the tribulation period are going to enter into the millennial with their physical bodies. They will reproduce. And listen, Jesus will rule with the rod of iron. It'll be a benevolent dictatorship. But at the end, people's true colors are going to come out. They're going to form a rebellion. And they're going to try to what? They're going to come against God, and God is going to destroy them and defeat Israel's enemies, even at the end of the millennium. There's one other war that you probably haven't heard of. It's not talked about. It's called the Psalm 83 War. It's called the Psalm 83 War. We don't have time to go into the Psalm 83 War, but basically here is what it talks about. We don't know when this is going to happen, but... Here are the nations, if you read Psalm 83, this is talked about in prophecy where these nations here, this is their ancient names, I'll give you a second to look at them, but these are their names, now here are the contemporary uh, names, go to the next slide, these are the, basically the countries that are going to come against Israel, Saudi Arabia, the Palestinians, Central Jordan, the Egyptians, Hezbollah, North Lebanon, Palestinians, North Jordan, Sinai, Hamas of Gaza, Hezbollah, Syria. In other words, all nations that want to wipe Israel off the map. This is called the War of Psalm 83. Commentators disagree on this as to when it's going to happen. We don't know exactly when. What is God going to do if you read Psalm 83? He's going to protect Israel during that time. And so what have we learned in the first part of this vision with the four chariots? What we have learned is this, God will defeat Israel's enemies. And there is a near fulfillment. That refers to a little bit prior to Zechariah and after Zechariah. That would be the near fulfillment. God defeated Egypt. He defeated Assyria. He defeated Babylon. He defeated Persia, he defeated Greece, and he defeated Rome. That's the near fulfillment, as it were. But then there is the far fulfillment where God will judge Israel's enemies. He will judge Israel's enemies during the tribulation period, during the battle of Gog and Magog, Armageddon, second coming, the end of the millennial, and the Psalm 83 war. God will protect his people. This does not mean that there won't be many Jews that die. But have you noticed, if you read the Old Testament, all those nations that we read about, many of them do not exist anymore. The Gergesites, the Perizzites, and all the ites in the Bible, all of them are no longer around as a nation, but Israel has been preserved by God. Why? Romans 11 says that God has a future for Israel. And listen, the day America stops befriending Israel, we are in trouble. That's why God has protected us. And so in Zechariah chapter 6, the eighth vision that Zechariah sees are these four chariots ridden by angels coming through these two bronze mountains. Bronze represents judgment, and it represents that God is going to judge Israel's enemies. Now listen, that would have been an encouragement to Israel at that time. Why? Because listen, Israel was tired of being oppressed by her enemies. And you want to know why they were oppressed? Because of their disobedience. But Israel was hoping that the Messiah would come and defeat their enemies. And that leads us to the second and final point for this evening. And that is this. Once God judges Israel's enemies, you have secondly in Zechariah chapter 6, the establishment of Christ's kingdom or his universal rule, and this would be through the crowning of Joshua. Now, the crowning of Joshua is not a ninth vision. It's not part of the eight visions. The crowning of Joshua is more the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, and he spoke it, but I include it here because it's a part of chapter 6. Chapter 6. 
And so let's see the establishment of Christ's universal kingdom beginning in verse 9 of Zechariah chapter 6. Notice it doesn't say a vision came to Zechariah. It says the word of the Lord also came to me saying, take an offering. See, God's not against offerings, is he? We're going to take one now. Let's pass the plate. No. Take an offering from the exiles, from and I'm going to try to pronounce these names, Heldai, Tobijah, and Jediah. Now, who are these three individuals? Well, they probably were coming back from Babylon. They were exiles in Babylon. They were coming back, watch this, with some money to make a contribution to the rebuilding of the temple. And so God knows they're coming back, and so he says to Zechariah, I want you to take an offering from these three exiles. And then he says, and you go to the same day and enter the house of Josiah after you take their offering. In other words, Zechariah had to say, uh, guys, by the way, the offering you're going to make to the temple, uh, the Lord has instructed me that I'm to take that and do something different with it. And notice what they were going to do with it. It says, they would enter the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah, where they have arrived from Babylon. And here's what God tells them to do. Take silver and gold, and he says to Zechariah, make an ornate crown and set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Now, you got to remember, that was radical. Because listen, priests would never serve in a kingly role. And the crowning of Joshua represented the fact that he was symbolically acting as a king. And so as we're going to see the symbolism here, Jesus is our priest and he's also what? Our king. And so he's telling them to do this symbolic act. Now, what was the purpose of the symbolism? Notice, if you will, verse 14, he gives us the meaning of this symbolic act of crowning Joshua. Now, the crown will become a reminder in the temple of the Lord to Helim, Tobijah, and Jediah, and Hen, the son of Zephaniah. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you, and it will take place if you completely obey the Lord your God. And so here is the symbolism of the crowning of Joshua. What this represented is this, the crowning of Joshua and its placing in a high spot in the temple window would serve as a reminder of the coming Messiah and his universal kingdom. In other words, what they did was this, they took the crown and they put it on Joshua's head. That was a symbolic reminder to them that there is coming a Messiah who would rule as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That was the symbolism. By putting that crown on Joshua, God was communicating to the Israelite remnant, not only will I defeat your enemies, but I want you to know that there is a Messiah that is going to come, because that was the hope of every Jew that the Messiah would come. And the fact that Joshua is being crowned symbolizes that Messiah will come and he will rule. And watch this. They were to take that crown, God says in Zechariah 6, and they were to put it in the temple as a reminder. What does that mean? Well, tradition says this. This temple that they rebuilt, it's called Zerubbabel's temple, there was a window high up in the temple, and they said this crown was actually in that window for every Jewish person to see. And so not only did they crown Joshua, but they took the crown off eventually and they put it up in that window as a reminder that one day their Messiah would come. And so what God is doing is he's encouraging this remnant and telling them that Jesus Christ would come and set up his kingdom. But watch this. Are you listening? Say amen. Amen. It was contingent on their obedience. Now listen, Jesus is coming back regardless of whether the Jews were obedient or not. But the timing of when it would happen, watch this, is contingent upon their obedience. Look at verse 15. Here's what God said. And it will take place if you completely obey the Lord. Now, here's what happened. Jesus came during his earthly ministry, and you know what he said to the Jewish people? 
he came to his own. He said this, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. The kingdom of God is at hand, Jesus said, repent. And you know what the Jewish people did? They said, we're not going to repent. We reject you as our Messiah. And so you know what Jesus said? I'm going to postpone the coming of the kingdom. You say, theoretically, if the Jewish nation received Jesus during his earthly ministry, would Jesus have set up his kingdom during that time? Theoretically, yes. But God knows the future. And because the Jewish people said no to Jesus during his earthly ministry, you know what Jesus did? He postponed his kingdom and he turned to the Gentiles. And so the Jewish people are still awaiting their Messiah as the Gentiles are, but the Jewish people are still waiting. Why? Because of their disobedience. And so you'll notice the slide up on the screen here. You will notice the Jewish people thought that there was only one coming of Jesus. The Messiah would come and set up his kingdom. That's how they understood it. The Jewish people did not see two comings of Messiah. You understand that? They did not see two comings of Jesus. They did not see the church age in the middle. We're in this church age right now, and we're awaiting the second coming. If you read the Old Testament, Jewish people only saw one coming. Messiah would come and set up his kingdom. But because the Jewish people said no to Jesus, what happened? God postponed the coming of Jesus' kingdom, and so now you have a second coming we're awaiting, and we are in the church age. Now, as we close, God is going to tell us several things about the Messiah when he comes to earth. Zechariah 6 is going to give us several characteristics of Jesus when he comes to earth. Let me share them with you real briefly as we close. Number one, he will rule on David's throne. When he comes back and sets up his universal kingdom, he will rule on David's throne. Notice, if you will, verse 12 of Zechariah 6. Then say to him, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, a man. Now that's reminiscent of John 19.5. Do you remember when Jesus was standing before Pilate? What did Pilate say in Latin? Ece home, behold the man. God says of Jesus... Thus says the Lord of hosts, behold a man whose name is what? Branch. That word branch means a shoot or a sprout. It's referred to in Isaiah chapter 11. And what that's saying is he will come from David. Jesus, the Messiah, was a descendant of David, which means this, he will rule on David's throne. David had an everlasting dynasty. Most people's dynasties at some point ends David has an eternal dynasty. Why? Because Jesus in his, his, in his messianic line. And so he will rule on David's throne when he comes back and sets up his universal rule. Now, some people think it's literal in that when he comes, he's going to set up his literal headquarters in Jerusalem, and he's going to reign from Jerusalem on David's throne. He gives another characteristic of his universal rule about Messiah. He will be from the nation of Israel. When Jesus comes back to set up his kingdom, obviously he's coming from Israel, verse 12 of Zechariah 6, for he will branch out from where he is. In other words, he's going to descend from Israel, Isaiah 53, 2 says. And then he gives a third characteristic, and this one is very interesting. He will build God's millennial temple, verse 12, and he will build the temple of the Lord, yes, It is he who will build the temple of the Lord. Those who are far away, that is Gentiles, will come and help to build the temple of the Lord. You could read about this in Isaiah chapter 2 where it says Gentiles will help build the temple of the Lord. Now, what does it mean he will build the temple of the Lord? Some people say that what this means is he's going to build the church because you and I are the temple of the Lord. The Spirit lives within us. And so this is a prophecy, Matthew 16, where Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That is one view. Covenant theology holds that view, Presbyterians. But dispensational theology says this, during the millennial kingdom, there is going to be a literal temple that's going to be rebuilt. Let me show you some pictures so you'll get the idea. Now, if you read Ezekiel in his book, uh, 
Here are the chapters. When you get to chapters 40 through 48, Ezekiel describes a millennial temple during this time. It's a bizarre eight chapters. A lot of people don't know what to do with them. They're difficult. But here's the dimensions of the temple that he describes. And many people believe that this is going to be a millennial temple that is going to be built while Jesus rules from Jerusalem. Here are the dimensions that Ezekiel gives. You have the outer court. We're not going to go through all this, but here's kind of a sketch of what it looks like. Next slide. Here's another sample of Ezekiel's temple. Now, here's where it's controversial. Watch this. During that time of the thousand-year kingdom, when this temple is built, you're going to have priests, and you're going to have animal sacrifices that are going to be offered during that time. And people ask the question, well, why is there going to be animal sacrifices? It's to memorialize what Jesus did on the cross. Other commentators say, "Uh uh-uh, time out. The book of Hebrews says we no longer offer animal sacrifices. That points to Jesus Christ. And so this creates controversy. People don't know where to put Ezekiel 40 through 48. And so you either take it literal, and there is a literal temple that's going to be built during the millennial, or you spiritualize the chapter and say it applies to the church. That's often what you get. Here is the temple size comparison. This is the millennial temple right here, Ezekiel's temple, compared to Herod's temple, Solomon's temple, the tabernacle, American football field. You can see it's quite large. Now, I'm not saying I have the answers on this. I struggle with this section because I don't know where to fit it in my theological box. But if I'm going to be hermeneutically consistent and take the Bible literal, this says there's going to be a millennial temple that's going to happen. Well, he gives a couple more things as we close, and that is this. The final thing it says about Messiah when he sets up his millennial temple is he will rule on his throne as priest and king. Notice verse 13 of Zechariah 6. And he who will bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne. He's a king. He's ruling on his throne, but watch this. Thus, he will be a priest on his throne... And the council of peace will be between the two offices. Those offices did not mix in the Old Testament. If a priest or a king tried to act like a priest, what happened? The king often got cursed like Uzziah. And so what's going to happen is Jesus is going to be the perfect priest and the perfect king. And so what have we learned tonight in Zechariah chapter 6? We've learned that God will judge Israel's enemies. That's the four chariots coming through the mountains. And then the crowning of Joshua and taking that crown, putting it in the temple, is a symbol that one day, not only will God judge Israel's enemies, but Messiah will come and set up his thousand-year millennial kingdom where we will worship him as priest and king. And as we end, what should our response be? I think Hebrews 12 says it very succinctly. The writer gives a warning and he says, see to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? Make sure you're a believer. Make sure you know Jesus Christ. Make sure that you're going to rule and reign with him during that time of the kingdom. And then notice what he says in verse 26, at that time, his voice shook the earth from Mount Sinai, but now he has promised, once more, I will shake not only the earth, but I'm going to shake the heavens. The words, verse 27, once more, indicate the removing of what can be shaken. In other words, this earth is temporary. The fact that he uses the word shake means that this life is temporary. What you see is going to ultimately burn up. And he says this, the words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken that has created things so that what cannot be shaken may remain. What's going to last is God's eternal kingdom. Don't invest all your time only in your family, only in your prosperity. Listen, that's going to burn up. So he says in verse 28, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful.
And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Look up, people. Be encouraged. God is going to judge, listen, not just Israel's enemies, but watch this. He's going to judge your enemies and my enemies. And listen, we don't say that with glee. On the one hand, we rejoice that God is going to judge Christ rejectors. On the other hand, we grieve. Why? Because we don't want people to be destroyed. God is going to judge our enemies one day. And listen, we are awaiting the coming of Jesus Christ. We are closer for the Him coming and setting up His kingdom. Listen, what are you doing with your faith? What are you doing with your time? What are you doing with your talents, your treasures? Are you involved? Are you engaged? Yes, it's a battle. We're all going to battle. But here's the issue. Where's your focus? Let's be passionate about Jesus. Because listen, we don't want to stand before him and he says, you know, I gave you all this and you squandered it. You didn't use it for my honor and my glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for this challenging section. Zechariah is a great book. But Lord, a lot of imagery, a lot of apocalypse going on. But we thank you, Lord God, that you have given us your word and you've communicated it through images and metaphor and visions. Father, I thank you that you will protect Israel's enemies. Uh, You will defeat them one day and you will protect Israel. And thank you, Lord God, that you will judge our enemies as well. Your word says that vengeance belongs to you. And I think about all the persecuted Christians around the world right now that are suffering. God, strengthen them, encourage them. And Father, we pray for their persecutors that they would get saved. But God, we know in the end that those who reject you and kill your people, like the martyrs under the altar in Revelation chapter 6, they said, how long, O Lord, before you avenge our blood? And you said to them, wait a little bit longer. Father, we thank you that you will vindicate your people. And we thank you that Jesus Christ is going to come back. This isn't a fairy tale. It is the truth. Just as surely as he came the first time, he will come the second time. And Father, we thank you that he will set up his kingdom and we will rule and reign with him on his throne, Father. What a, what a joyous future awaits us. And Father, I pray that we would live our lives in light of that. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name.